A guten Erev Shabbos. This Shabbos is indeed a very special Shabbos. It's called Shabbat Chazak, a Shabbos of strength. When we complete our reading of the book of Genesis this Shabbat morning, Chumash Bereshis, which we began back on Simchas Torah morning, we will stand together and we'll stay, say, Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazek. May we all be strengthened. Please, God, may it be so. That simple act itself is a kind of bracha, a blessing we invoke upon ourselves individually and communally. When someone sneezes, you automatically say gesundheit or bless you, which mean close to the same thing. You're blessing the person who just sneezed that they be well and have good health. What's all that about? It's the tremendous and awesome power we have to bless each other. The Torah is clear that human beings have the capacity to bless each other. God tells Moshe to tell Aaron and his sons, so shall you bless the Jewish people. In the, preference, in the preface to the priestly blessing that we read in Dvarim, Deuteronomy, in the summertime. And after the text of Yevarechecha, which our Kohanim here at KST bestow on us with much love from time to time, the Torah continues, V'samu es shemi al b'nei Yisrael v'ani avarachem. They will place my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them, says God. So clearly, finite human beings have the capacity, even the obligation, to call down God's blessings on one another. Even more than that, it works. Every time you say, have a safe trip, have a good day, cold too, all the best, es gesunter hate, stay healthy, bon voyage, it's all calling down God's blessings on each other. And heaven knows you cannot have too much of that. An outstanding feature of the Sedra, we'll read this Shabbos, Vayichi, is the blessings, the brachas. As Yaakov prepares to come to the end of his life in this world, he beckons his sons to gather around and he speaks to each one individually. Some of the blessings are phrased with undertones of rebuke, but each really is a bracha, a blessing of its own type, specific to that child and ultimately to their whole tribe. To Yehuda, Judah, for example, whose name we carry as Yehudim, he says, your brothers will acknowledge you, submit respect to you. Yehuda ato yoducha achecha, he says. Part of this acknowledgement is that when a Jew is asked who he is, he will mention you. I am a Yehudi. I am from Yehuda. Yehuda is like a young lion. Gur arye Yehuda, it says. How's that? Yehuda's reign will begin modestly. The first king of Yehuda's tribe will be David HaMelech, King David. At first he will be subservient to Shaul, King Saul, who was a Benjaminite. Later he will grow as a lion and his kingdom will spread far and wide. Yoda is also to admit something. And to remember a few weeks ago that Yehuda admitted his connection to Tamar, which saved her from an unjust death penalty. He could have falsely denied his deed, but he confessed. For all this, he will have the strength of a lion. Lo yesor shevet mi Yehuda, says his father, the scepter of rule shall not depart from Judah. The royal line of the Jewish people will descend from you. The dominance of Yehuda will remain in place until Moshe, who will come from the tribe of Levi and will remain there for a while. But from then on, every king of Israel will be from the tribe of Yehuda, except for Shaul, as we said. And that will be the way things are until the Messianic age. Ad ki yavai shiloi, velo yikas amim. To him the nations will submit. The Redeemer will ultimately command the respect of all humanity. Shiloh, Shiloh, by the way, has several levels of meaning, one of which is that he will be a naturally born human being, not any kind of semi-divinity or anything like that to anticipate those who might think otherwise. More blessings that Yehuda's land will be fertile and lush. Osri legefen iro, he will load his donkey with a grapevine, means even the weakest vine in Yehuda's share of the land of Israel will yield enough to load down a donkey. Yehuda's mountains will sparkle with wine and the land will be plentiful in so many ways. Yalkut Me'amloiz points out that this whole series of verses that constitute Yaakov's blessings to Yehuda are performative utterances. 
As we said, they invoke blessings for all these things. And yet there's one thing missing. The letter Zion is not to be found in this whole sequence. Yalkut references Rabbeinu Bachia's comment that Zion is the Hebrew word for weapons, weaponry. Its absence is as constitutive as the presence of the rest. Yehuda's reign will not be enforced by strength of arms or military might, rather by the sustaining holiness of the divine word. Another set of blessings that are given sort of in tandem to Yisachar and Zavulun. Zavulun, he says, will settle on seashores. He'll be a harbor for ships. His flank shall reach Sidon. When the land of Israel is divided among the tribes, Zavulun will get some beachfront property. And what became, or maybe already was, the port of Sidon. Yisachar will be like a donkey, crouching beneath the, between the saddlebags. He bends his shoulder to the burden, it says. This is the much-vaunted Issachar zavulun partnership, namely that some will be gifted and talented and have the wherewithal to engage in commerce, business, shipping, trade, and all the material wealth that that entails. Others will carry the yoke of Torah study without rest and with the dedication and immovable devotion of a donkey. Moreover, they will support one another. The wealth of zavulun will help support the needs of the scholars. And the merit and light that the scholars bring into the world will be shared by the merchants and traders who support them and thereby earn a share of their intangible wealth. The idea of partnership or division of labor is still an operative concept in many Jewish communities, allowing different people to focus on and maximize their strengths. Let's do one more. Naftali Ayala Shalucha, Hanosein Imre Shafer. Naftali is a messenger gazelle who delivers beautiful words. Imre Shafer can also be fine fruits, as in produce. The blessing asks that the crops will ripen with the swiftness of a gazelle or a deer. The Talmud tells how kings would exchange messenger, messages via gazelles. I guess this was before they discovered carrier pigeons. Apparently, these animals gravitate to their home. So if you release a gazelle in the north, from the, if you release a gazelle in the south who's from the north, it'll return there. One from the south will return there. Ramban explains you just tied your note to the antlers and set the animal free to run home. Yet another layer of understanding of the bracha is the fine produce of this portion of land would cause people to praise God with imre shafer, beautiful words of blessing. There's a thought in the Gemara Brachas, that, which, we say, uh, which we learned, that says that the descendants of Naphtali are the most resound, renowned chazanim. They have a gift in the field of cantorial arts. Just bringing Naphtali up to our times, if you think back to the original versions of the logo of Rishut HaDoar, the Israeli Postal Service, or if you're old enough to recall Asimonim, the phone tokens that you had to purchase at the post office, you'll recall that the logo is a deer scampering along. This is in fact based on our verse here. Naphtali is a messenger gazelle who delivers beautiful words. There's a fascinating and beautiful and informative discussion in Rashi and the commentators about each of the brachas Yaakov gave to each of the tribes. At the end of the whole sequence of blessings, it says, Vayivarach Aysam Ish, Asher kevir chasai berach aysam. He blessed them each according to his blessing that he blessed them. Sorry. He blessed them each according to his blessing he blessed them. It sounds repetitive, but it's always got something to teach us. First of all, the words to some, like Shimon and Levi, who, if you remember, avenged the assault on their sister Dina, was seemingly more a rebuke than a bracha. So why the seemingly redundant repetition? Ralbag, Rabbi Levi ben Gershon, or Gersonides as some call him, say that as mortals we have to know our milas and our chasroinas, our strong qualities and our shortcomings, if we're going to be able to grow and develop. If we don't recognize what talents and abilities we have and what our weak sides are, we'll be very hard pressed to ever change or transform ourselves. In that sense, says the Ralbag, not only the words of obvious benediction, but in a way, even more so, the critiques of some of the brothers were, in fact, a great bracha, insofar as it allowed them to move forward with greater self-knowledge. It emerged later on in Egypt 
that the descendants of those tribes who got as much rebuke as blessing here, namely Reuven, Shimon, and Levi, according to Midrash Rabban, Bemidbar, they were the ones who were best able to resist the spiritual temptations of Mitzrayim during the years of enslavement. Even more, Rashi and others note that the wording of Beirach Oisam rather than Beirach Oisai, the Torah is careful to narrate that Yaakov blessed them rather than he blessed him, each one, meaning they would ultimately all come to be blessed from one another. Spoiler alert to next week's Parsha, the tribes will all be mentioned in the context of descending into Egypt, and next week's Parsha is the first that mentions Moshe Rabbeinu. So the Jewish people from the Avos, the patriarchs, to the Shvatim, the tribes, to Moses and Aaron are all linked in a chain, which we, of course, form one of the latest, most recent links. In his commentary on this Parsha, Parsha's Vayichi, the concluding Parsha of the book of Genesis, of Chumash Bereshis, Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik, Zechrona Levracha, quotes the Zohar to explain how we are supposed to grow and develop by emulating the Midos, the qualities or emanations, as it were, of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, of God. And these personality traits that are part of all of us have to be channeled or directed in the most positive and productive direction. Shimon and Levi, for example, had a strong drive towards zealotry, which led them to avenging Shem's assault on their sister Dina, which was quite violent and of which their father disapproved and told them so. However, their stringent dedication later came to serve them well. For example, in the battle against Amalek, battling absolute evil, there can be no compromise. So the blessings of this week's portion are some of them realized and evident, some of them yet to be actualized, still concealed, remaining in potential. That's a deeper understanding of the blessings of each of the Shivtei Yisrael, each of the children of Israel, that we read about in such detail, and also the bracha of chazak, chazak, which we will say at the conclusion of reading the Sefer, and also in general, all the brachas, all the blessings and good wishes we give to one another. Some of us are actually kohanim, with the special mitzvah to bless, with the words yivarechacha, which we mention in our davening several times each day. The rest of us have in mind to be mamleches kohanim, v'goi kadosh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, as we'll read in a few weeks in Parshas Yisra when we're all standing together at Sinai. Each of us has a special capacity to bless, to invoke God and godliness into every act, into every moment of life. That's what bracha, or blessing, is. We wish not only for each other, but in the model of the children of Israel in this parsha, according to the Midrash, we are blessed from one another, that as a community, as a people, we help each other and are helped by each other to bring all our strengths and capacities to best use in transforming the world around us for the good and the holy. May we see together ever more realization of these blessings in good health and in peace. Shabbat Shalom.